Well, judging uh, judging by tonight's turnout, I guess there's a lot of interest in the Supreme Court. Uh, good evening and um, welcome to Politics and Prose. I'm uh, Brad Graham, the co-owner of the bookstore, along with my wife, Lisa Muscatine, and we're, we're very excited to have with us uh, journalist Joan Biskupic here to talk about her new book, uh, Nine Black Robes, uh, Inside the Supreme Court's Drive to the Right and Its Historic Consequences. Uh, Joan, of course, is a longtime chronicler of the Supreme Court and a journalist who's uh, widely viewed as uh, knowing the court as, as well as anyone who's covering it now. Uh, she's been writing about the court and legal affairs for three decades, uh, previously for the Washington Post, USA Today, and Reuters, and more recently as a senior Supreme Court analyst for CNN. Her experience, knowledge, fairness, and insight have shown not only in, in her journalism, uh, but also in her uh, expert uh, biographies about some of the justices, including John Roberts, Sonia Sotomayor, Antonin Sc Sc uh, Scalia, and Sandra Day O'Connor. In Nine Black Robes, Joan provides an inside look at the whole court uh, and its sharp lurch to the right. Uh, this conservative transformation uh, has been uh, underway for a while, uh, but as Joan documents in extensive detail, it has gone into overdrive with the justices uh, nominated and confirmed under Donald Trump. Uh, and it's having profound consequences for the country uh, on a range of issues, from abortion and voting rights to government regulatory power and the separation of church and state. Uh, Joan's book is, uh, is fascinating and, and illuminating. It's comprehensive uh, and even-handed. And no doubt many readers will find uh, what it says about the court's current course very disturbing. Uh, Joan herself uses terms like off the rails, going backward, <laughs> and laying waste to precedence uh, in her blunt description of what's happening. In conversation with Joan this evening will be someone uh, uh, who I'm sure is familiar to many of you, uh, Jake Tapper, uh, who's not only a leading anchor at CNN and chief Washington correspondent, but also the author of two entertaining best-selling novels, The Devil May Dance and The Hellfire Club, and an excellent work of nonfiction, The Outpost, about a deadly battle in Afghanistan involving U.S. forces. Jake's next novel, uh, All the Demons Are Here, is due out on July 11th. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Joan Biskupic and Jake Tapper. So this is um, great and fun and very familiar. I'm in this bookstore at least twice a week. And I talk to Joan at least three or four times a week uh, on air. So uh, you'll forgive me if I get a little casual um, just because I'm used to it all. I, uh, it, when when um, you were just being introduced, uh, he talked about how you've been chronicling the Supreme Court for three decades. And uh, a book that was not mentioned, a book I wrote about the Florida recount uh, called Down and Dirty uh, in 2001, before some of the people here were born, uh, but not most, uh, was um, I referred to Joan, I think in just like a footnote or maybe at the, an end note, I referred to her as the best Supreme Court reporter in the country. Uh, and she was at USA Today then. I'd never met her, I just read her. Uh, and she was at USA Today uh, then, and uh, so, it's so it's such a joy to call her a colleague. I thought it then, and I think it even more now, and this book, uh, Nine Black Robes, is so good. Um, before I get to the questions about the book, though, um, we have some business to attend to when it comes to uh, the court today, uh, which deferred a final decision on this ruling having to do with this Texas judge, this gentleman from Amarillo, um, who has decided, uh, despite uh, conservatives saying that uh, the Dobbs decision overturning Roe v. Wade was just doing what was needed to be done and sending the decision back to the states, and now the states would just get to make up their own minds about what they wanted, uh, this judge decided, not so fast, uh, I would like to impose great restrictions on the use of mifepristone, mifep sorry, um, yeah, I usually have a teleprompter to help me with that. Um, <laughs> And uh, MIFI, as it's called in the, uh, in the abortion rights community, uh, is now 
basically you could take it, uh, it's used in, in the uh, first 10 weeks of pregnancy to end of pregnancy with a different kind of pill. And uh, it's been restricted now. You, you can't do it through telehealth or mail. You can't get it at a pharmacist. Uh, you have to use it at seven weeks. You cannot use it at eight, nine, or 10 weeks as it had been. So it, he's uh, substituting his authority for that of the FDA. We thought we were gonna get a decision today I see Jessica Schneider right there, our, our, one of our Supreme Court, one of our uh, ju justice reporters. I feel like I'm doing your job right now. <laughs> I'm setting up the conversation between me and Joe. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, uh, but they, they didn't make a decision. They kicked it to Friday. What's going on? Are they about to uphold this ban, this, this partial ban on Mifepristone? Okay, well first, am I okay, Greg? Yeah. Uh, just put, first just, of all, I yep. want to say, Brad and everyone at Politics and Prose. Brad and I go all the way back to 1993 when I was at the Washington Post. And I love that Jake referred to that. It was a footnote in your book that I remember well. And so many of my Supreme Court colleagues saw that you cited me as the best Supreme Court reporter in the country and said, how do you know Jake? How does Jake know you? Do you know Jake? <laughs> you know, nobody thought. And pure merit, said, pure merit. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so let's get to the news of the day, which I'm so glad broke earlier in the day because we thought that we would be here with everybody looking at their phones wondering what's the court doing, what's the court doing. What it's done is it's bought itself 48 hours. It's ju it just, they were not ready to decide. So let me tell you what it says about the fact that they were not ready to decide whether to give a longer stay of the lo lower court uh, action or to outright deny the Biden administration and the drug manufacturers who really want to make sure that the abortion medication drug stays on the market without serious restrictions. They obviously are split. They don't have a clear majority to either say, yes, we're gonna grant this postponement or we're going to deny it. Can you hold the mic closer to your mouth? I'm yeah. getting some requests. Okay, great. So it's, it, what we have is nine justices torn. There is not a majority yet. And if they're close to a majority, there might be some dissenters. And what they've given themselves to is 11.59 Friday <laughs> night, which uh, I'm sure most of us are hoping that it doesn't go to that, but I think it, it shows just how close this is for them at this preliminary stage. They're not even deciding yet whether the merits of this controversy, they're just deciding whether this rush of litigation that's essentially, what, about a month and a half old now is, you know, should be the, the state of play in America or if things should revert to the way they've been for some 23 years with FDA approval of the drug. So when we started talking about this a month ago, a month and a half ago, yeah. and uh, I sensed that jo Joan thought that for any number of reasons, uh, deferral to uh, the FDA, uh, which, and, and w which would just demolish the precedent of judges just, you know, um, showing deference to the FDA and other agencies. Uh, standing, questions of lack of standing about the, the people who brought this suit, which is a bunch of um, anti-abortion doctors and healthcare providers. But the question is to why, you know, what right do they have, what standing do they have to bring this? There are a number of reasons why Joan thought that this might not become what it is becoming right now. And uh, I, I admit, I was, uh, I, I, I'm not surprised, right? But you see the positive in people. So, um, <laughs> so I said, just Joan. I, 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 I think I said this on air too. I said, you okay, they're the three. They're the three liberal justices. Obviously, they want to keep this this drug that's been legal and considered safe by the FDA for for 20 years. Um, I, I know, I know. Sotomayor and Kagan and Jackson will vote to keep it. You can maybe convince me that Roberts. Would would vote to keep it too. Who's the fifth vote, Joan? Who is the fifth vote? <laughs> and you didn't have an answer for I, me. I got. I, no, I started explaining Justice Kavanaugh's concurrence because mm. what I keep stressing to Jake on air, in our newsroom, and at Politics and Prose is that this is a different case than Dobbs. In on June 24th, you know, they completely eviscerated the constitutional protection for abortion, but they said we're giving it to the states and states that want to keep abortion legal can keep abortion legal. Brett Kavanaugh, who cast the key fifth vote, said we are not outlawing abortion nationwide. And if you get rid of this abortion medication, you are effectively undercutting it in the states that make it legal. 
But so that's about fifty. About, about fifty percent of the abortions uh, in the in the U.S. are done this way. Yes, we should say we should know. Right, right. So, so she did. The, she did say that, and she quoted Kavanaugh saying that last year. And I said, oh, so you're suggesting that Kavanaugh would never change his mind and break with precedent? Uh, Senator Susan Collins might take issue uh, with that, perhaps. Perhaps we'll see. I suppose. So I guess we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. And I do have to admit that I do tend to hold out hope that they're going to reach some sort of compromise, just like I thought, as you know, that maybe in the end Chief Justice Roberts might have prevailed. And I was wrong on that. I was also wrong on the age-old question of would the Supreme Court ever ter overturn Roe v. Wade. And for years and years I said they never will because they would fear both the legal and political consequences. But these, this is a different kind of court. So I will be ready to be corrected if they undercut the FDA's authority, and we'll know uh, the first step of that. You're not often I wrong. I, I should know. You're not often. You're almost always right. And and uh, but Chief Justice Roberts, uh, I think it's fair to say, and this is what the book's about. So we'll talk about this now. He kind of lost control of the of the of the court, right? Yeah, for the, what I call it, the defining case of his generation, the Dobbs case. You know, reversing nearly a half century of abortion rights, he lost control of that case. Now, part of it might have been the leak. Part of it might have been that Donald Trump vowed to appoint only justices who would overturn Roe v. Wade, and the three justices he appointed were ready to overturn Roe v. Wade, very unlike previous Republican appointees who, no matter how much they disliked Roe v. Wade, were ready to uphold the precedent. So, yeah, and John Roberts would have been one of those justices who would have held, upheld the precedent even though he would have allowed a 15-week ban on abortions. Right. And you write, it's the opening line in the book, from the dissenters in the Dobbs case, uh, which overturned Roe v. Wade, no one should be confident that this majority is done with its work. And who wrote that? Was it uh, Sotomayor? It was, well, you know, it's interesting, Jake. They did in a very unusual three-justice dissent. It was Justice Elena Kagan, Stephen Breyer, and uh, Sonia Sotomayor were the three who penned that. I think I know which justices gave us that line. Who? It's just a guess. It's speculation. It's speculation. Right, it's just, it's but we're, just a, we're just among friends. <laughs> we're just no, among friends. I, it, it, we're not going to hold got, you to it's it. It's got a ring of Elena Kagan in okay. it. But, um, but the three of them joined together because what they wanted to do is recall what the three uh, justices who controlled Planned Parenthood versus Casey back in 1992, those three justices had uh, joined together to save Roe. These three justices joined together as Roe was going down. So, um, and, and they're not the only ones who suggested that uh, the Dobbs decision might pave a path towards other precedents being ripped up. Uh, Justice Thomas, Clarence right. Thomas did, uh, re referring to Griswold v. Connecticut, which legalized birth control pills, uh, as well as the, what's the case in Texas? Lawrence v. Texas? Yeah, uh, intimate relations among same-sex couples. And loving, even. Loving v. Virginia, yes. right? Interracial marriage. And I mean, who knows? Oh, Bergefell, the, uh, say, right. right. Uh, same-sex marriage. And, and so how likely do you think action is based on your research for this book uh, on it, on any of those other cases? No, I think, well, some of the older ones probably not, but I think it's a very real question, what will happen to Obergefell? Maybe not the basic right to same-sex marriage, but there'll be more and more exceptions for businesses that want to discriminate against same-sex couples in services. And, you know, I was at a point before, as I said, that they'll never overturn Roe v. Wade, Today, I would say to you, they'll never overturn Obergefell versus Hodges. It's a different kind of case, but I never say never anymore. Yeah, I felt like you just put a jinx on it <laughs> by, 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 by saying that. So your previous books were studies of one justice. Mm -hmm. um, why why the, the entire organization? Why all nine in uh, this for this book? For two reasons. The last one, of course, was the chief. Uh, on John Roberts in 2019, and I'd sort of run out of individual figures. I had done uh, Sandra Day O'Connor, Antonin Scalia, and then a political history of Sonia Sotomayor's nomination. I'd run out of people who I felt were far enough along in their tenure and interesting enough. And around the time that I was sort of thinking, well, what next? I realized that something different was going on behind the scenes, in part a Trump effect. 
I started working on this one in late 2019, early 2020. And when I actually sold the proposal, just like three weeks before COVID shut down everything, I thought I would do a very interior book about maneuvering. I had no idea that I would have such an exterior story about the reversal of Roe. And what made this one interesting for me was once I was able to buy time from my publisher to say we have to see what happens in this Dobbs ruling and I thought I'm just gonna be tacking it on and will how will it fit with this overall arc of the story of the Trump effect on the court and John Roberts losing control in a big way I realized I had seen it coming even though I didn't know I saw it coming I didn't have to rewrite anything in the beginning it was all like the pieces were there but I was in a bit of denial I, guess. I think no I think you knew it was coming and I think you knew it was coming, and and you knew it here. Yeah. You knew it in your kishkas, as my people would say, and you you didn't necessarily yeah, want to acknowledge I, it that's to right. yourself. That's right. No. When we were on air, I'd always say, "Oh, I think John Roberts still might work something out." Yeah. Um, and and Roberts was trying to convince the court that uh, the country was ready for uh, a ban on abortion after 15 weeks, which which is what the original Mississippi ban was was for. Uh, and then the and then after arguments, right? The Mississippi was like, "Oh, we can get the whole thing kicked." What happened was when Ruth Bader Ginsburg dies in uh, dies in uh, September of 2020, and is succeeded by Amy Coney Barrett, who everybody knew her record and why she was chosen in part was because of her record on abortion. And once that happened, Mississippi officials said, "We're going for the whole thing." They changed their argument, and the chief during oral arguments said, "You've." you've amended things you've said you're saying something different they're like yeah you know yeah and roberts was trying to set this path 15 weeks and he you know he was he was running come on who's with me like uh, the scene in uh, animal house when john belushi is, come on who's with me and like literally no one is behind him <laughs> no one is behind him with the 15 weeks and, and that no one was behind him during oral arguments when he pitched it and and I think he was trying to make headway, and he actually thought he could make headway, but then on May 2nd, when the draft was leaked, and everyone knew the five on the far right were together on this, I think it, it just froze all the votes. So, do you tell us who the leaker is in the book? No, I'm just joking, I read the book. Um, but uh, you and I have talked about this. Why did whoever leak it, why did they do it? And was it, you know, the question is, was it, a progressive who was so somebody who worked on this who worked was a clerk and you I know you don't know the answer but just to talk about this because it's juicy um, <laughs> was it a progressive clerk who was so shocked and upset and wanted to warn the country and have this stopped or the theory that I actually subscribe to was it some a conservative who who wanted Roe v Wade overturned um, and was worried about maybe Kavanaugh or Gorsuch going wobbly and wanted to kind of like, you know, s cement their position. Um, do you have, now we don't know who did it. We don't know who did no. it. We have no idea. But do you have a, do you have a, do, who, can I ask you who, which you, which, yeah, no, I, uh, which you subscribe to? Yeah, and I, I don't intend to go to my grave not knowing. I think these things <laughs> usually come out somehow. And I think, I actually think Politico isn't quite sure what the chain of events was that got it to him in some ways. Um, although I don't know, I don't know anything concretely. But I understand why Jake and many other people believe it must have come from the conservative wing because of the effect. And I think the effect is real, that uh, there's a, there's a good chance that Brett Kavanaugh might not have ever flipped over, but it, it ensured that he wasn't going to flip over when, um, when it was released. And so a lot of people say, well, doesn't it seem like it must have been a conservative justice or the spouse of a conservative justice or a, um, or possibly- Just one of the spouses, who knows, yeah. who knows or, who, or they're all married. Or a conservative <laughs> law clerk. Um, but I actually don't think any of those people would have done it. First of all, they had other means, and they had, uh, the conservative side of the bench had already sort of leaked a bit to the Wall Street Journal, which had run an editorial saying, you know, nobody go wobbly here. You know, we, uh, the Chief Justice is trying to make progress with, uh, with uh, Justice Kavanaugh and maybe Justice Barrett, so don't go over to that side. And I don't think it was in, it, it might have been an enraged liberal, but I still don't think it was a justice. I do not think it was a justice or a law clerk, only because these people are just so inside the lines kind of folks, and there were other ways that they could have done what they wanted to do. I think it was probably some combination of a, 
another full-time employee who maybe brought it home and somebody gives it to somebody else and somebody smartly realizes the value of it and gets it to Politico. So um, Chief Justice Roberts thinks that the esteem that the public has for the court has gone down so significantly because of the decisions that the court has made. Is that, do you agree with that? No, I, I think that that has fed into it. I think people see the decisions and they think, whoa, you know, they're reversing all this precedent. But I think it's more than that. What he has said when his colleagues raise the question about legitimacy is that, oh, they still, they still respect us, they just don't like our opinions. But actually, the polls don't show that that's quite right. They, a lot of the public believes that these decisions are much more politically charged than before. And when you see, as I said, Donald Trump saying, I'm only going to appoint people who will do this on Roe v. Wade, and it comes through, and the, the five, uh, the, uh, pardon me, the now six, uh, Republican-appointed conservatives all vote a lot the same on the bottom line. There are some variations among them, I'll, I'll acknowledge, and the three Democratic appointees are all liberals. It has such a neat alignment that says to the public, these things, you know, are, are reflections of politics. Right, and there, there haven't been, at least in recent years, we haven't seen, um, I think Breyer on occasion would, would rule in a, in a more conservative, more moderate way on like, especially some issues having to do with corporations or other famous, you know, uh, people, apostates like uh, Souter or others. Mm -hmm. You don't see a lot of people voting in a way that's surprising. Yeah, they used to be much more unpredictable. And look at uh, David Souter, who was appointed by George H.W. Bush, who gave rise to the chant among conservatives, no more suitors, was unpredictable. And John Paul Stevens, who was uh, appointed by Gerald Ford in 1975, turned out to be you know, a lefty, relatively speaking. You just yeah. don't have surprises anymore. Yeah, although it is interesting that Gorsuch has become kind of uh, a, a real champion of Native American rights yeah, in, a, that, in a way that wasn't uh, predicted, I don't that, think. That's absolutely true. You know, he, uh, and I've, I've tried to figure out why, because you know, he is from, uh, he's from Colorado. He, as many of you know, he actually spent his teenage years here because his mother had been uh, head of the EPA, the first female uh, administrator of the EPA under Ronald Reagan. So he's here, but he comes from the West and has a real sensitivity to Native Americans. And he also, Jake, the other thing where you're absolutely right to say Justice Gorsuch will break off on some uh, criminal cases also. Yeah. Um, the uh, Let's talk about um, some of the other controversies going on right now with the court that might also have something to do with the, the lower and lower esteem that mm -hmm. the public holds the court, in which the public holds the court, and that has to do uh, with Clarence Thomas, um, Justice Thomas, not declaring a lot of things he is supposed to be declaring, whether it is uh, extravagant gifts with his friend Harlan Crow, and I don't doubt for one second that Harlan Crow and he are, are friends, but extravagant, no I don't, I really don't, I, I'm sure they, they agree on a lot of stuff, but extravagant gifts, um, and also, there's been, a, there's been a number of violations of things that he didn't, and, and he's, he's tried to say, oh, I got some bad advice, some people told me that I didn't have to do that, the kind of thing that none of us would ever get away with uh, if we, oh, you know, my lawyer told me I didn't have to uh, declare that $300,000 in my income tax. Um, I made that up, that didn't happen. Um, but uh, does Roberts, well, you haven't, I'm sure you haven't talked to him about this, but like, does he not, see that maybe that's also part of the problem? And they don't have a code of ethics. They don't have a formal code of ethics. They say they follow the one that's in place for lower court judges, but there is no mechanism for, uh, if, if any of you had a complaint about a particular justice and you wanted to lodge it and have it resolved in some way, you couldn't. And in fact, if you had put in any kind of complaints against any of the current nine when they were lower court judges, you know, as, as did happen with Brett Kavanaugh, the minute the person ascended to the Supreme Court, they would all be tossed. You can't even, there is no resolution process in place at all for complaints against the Supreme Court, the nine Supreme Court justices. Okay, so Claire, uh, many of you have probably seen the ProPublica stories on Clarence Thomas, you know, the lavish trips that uh, Harlan Crow had paid for, the private jets, the super yachts, 
that was one whole story that Clarence Thomas did make a public statement on that, saying that he had gotten advice from some of his colleagues. He didn't name them. People thought, well, maybe Justice Scalia, because Scalia used to take fancy trips a lot. You know, who, who were his colleagues? I think he passed away on one of those fa uh, fancy yeah. trips, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, in February of 2016. So he, so he, but he used colleagues plural, and he said from uh, judicial officials. That was one episode. And then the second episode that's come out through ProPublica's reporting is the fact that Harlan Crow had bought properties from the Thomas family in Savannah, Georgia, and you know they were able to improve the properties. The mother's still living in one in one of the houses, and that he has not, not paying rent. Not she's not paying rent. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And there's some questions about insurance and taxes and things like that. But the point is that that was another thing where the Thomas family and Clarence Thomas specifically benefited from Harlan Crow's generosity, and that wasn't reported and he has acknowledged apparently that he should have been able to, should have reported that. So when when that story happened, I went on one of my favorite websites which is newspapers.com. You can go back hundreds and hundreds of years and see the actual page of newspaper. Um, and then the name is escaping me right now cuz uh, it's evening and I'm tired, but who is it in, in 1969 that was basically kicked Abe off? Abe Fortas. Abe Fortas. So yeah. Abe Fortas, pardon Abe Fortas. me. So Abe Fortas uh, had gotten a loan from a financier, a friend, mm -hmm. uh, who also, like Harlan Crow, did not have any business before the court, but unlike Harlan Crow, was under federal investigation. And the, the shame was such that Fortas basically was chased off the court. Yeah, and that is so different because Earl Warren, oh, this was such, you know, you know how the Democrats are with timing on justices and judges? This was perfect. You know, okay, Earl Warren wanted to leave the court in a way that Richard Nixon couldn't appoint his successor. He tells LBJ he's going to be going. LBJ tries to elevate Abe Fortas, who was then uh, a, an associate justice, to be chief. Well, that ratchets up the stakes among all the people who either don't like LBJ or don't like Abe Fortas. Fortas so this, this financial deal became much more of an issue. And Earl Warren, who was chief justice at the time, who actually, you know, would have wanted this all to resolve itself a little better so that Nixon wouldn't appoint his successor, uh, kind of also helped give the nudge to Abe Fortas. So it was a, just a different kind of time. The politics all aligned against Abe Fortas, whereas at this point, you, don't, you haven't heard any of the Republican members of Congress criticize Clarence Thomas, have you? No. Uh, Romney said something about it. Oh, yeah. It's, Romney said something uh, about, like, it stinks or something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah, something, something like something, that. Don't, don't quote me on that. So, but, ro yes. So I mean, then what happens is. It's always, it's always the, the asterisk, but except for Mitt Romney. It's always. Yes, right, right. Now right. that Cheney and Kinzinger are gone, it's yes, just it's poor, just poor little Mitt. Yeah. But then what happens is this whole uh, Abe Fortas debacle, not only does it, he, it makes him the, you know, the only justice who ends up getting pressured to leave the, the bench, but uh, then. <laughs> Nixon gets to appoint Earl Warren's successor, and that's how we get Warren Burger. Yeah. You know, so that's how that turned out for the And w w one of the things that was very interesting when I was reading these stories about it, because you're actually able on newspapers.com mm -hmm. able to, to like peruse the newspaper, is that there's an article uh, about um, Justice Chief Justice Earl Warren, uh, very upset because he wanted to impose a code of ethics, right. uh, and the court just said, nope, uh, we'll do it next time. And that was literally 1969. I am 54 years old. That was the year I was born. And they still haven't done it. They still have not brought any sort of code of ethics. That's right. And the Chief Justice wants a code of ethics. But this isn't like a case. You can't basically say we're voting six to three for a code of ethics and three people won't abide by it. So he needs unanimity. And I'm just wondering if this is another episode that's going to fade. Of course it will. And the other thing is that when they were doing the leak investigation, they didn't allow the FBI or, you know, MPD, the, the D.C. cops, to investigate who did the leak. And it's not clear it's actually a crime necessarily, but it was the marshal of the court. The marshal of the court who, guess what, was not able to sit down and put the justices under oath and ask them questions because they really live in their own little bubble. And they're, they don't have to abide by rules, and so none of them are gonna say, well, I will allow all this tough rules and ethics because Justice Thomas is such a problem, I am willing to accept this for myself as well. Why would they do it? They're having fun. <laughs> they are, they have a pretty good life up there. 
you know, they can just shut themselves off from people and they can presume that this will blow over like everything else. And what Chief Justice John Roberts has said in the past, he isn't saying this out loud right now, but the only way to get rid of us, impeachment and conviction, just like what would happen, happen to the uh, president. And he has said the one thing that people should know about the justices is they are not like politicians. If you don't like the way we rule, that's basically too bad. So tell us about some of the horse trading that has gone on behind the scenes because, um, I mean, we all know that they all, they, they really all do defend each other. We saw this when, it, when Ginsburg and Scalia were, were very close friends, would go on trips together. But beyond that, they really um, generally defend each other. We've seen some friction recently. But tell us about the horse trading that you go into in the book. Okay, so, you know, there are nine of them. And they will often break off and have, have certain packs. And what I, you know, I documented in the book on the chief, the chief justices, uh, multiple switched votes in the Obamacare case. And then in this book, I show how the, the chief and Anthony Kennedy worked on two gay rights cases in tandem. And this was just two years after uh, Justice Kennedy wrote the majority opinion, a 5-4 case, to declare same-sex marriage constitutional. And Chief Justice Roberts used his first and only dissent from the bench to complain about that. And, you know, just said, just who do we think we are that we would impose this on people? You know, this is something for state legislatures. And what he did, though, is he realized that he's got to, he can't be against them. He's got to join them to have more control. And the person he wanted to work with on subsequent gay rights cases was Anthony Kennedy. And they broke off on, and made a deal on two cases that I document. And what I say in the book is that sometimes other justices might know about uh, these pacts between uh, their colleagues. Sometimes the law clerks will know, but sometimes, you know, only the two who engage in that deal know about it. So it's, it's hard to ferret out, and I usually try to reconstruct these things after a number of years. Sometimes you're lucky enough to get something in real time, but they're, they don't do horse trading the way they do over on the legislative side, but they do engage in deals, and they uh, resist the suggestion that they do, but that's how business gets done. Right, but Roberts, Chief Justice Roberts, would prefer nine nothing dis rulings all the time if he could, right? I mean, he knows, oh, he yeah. knows he's not going to get it, but that's, he's not a, um, he doesn't like the divisions. No, and he, I, I document in the book how in the Trump uh, financial documents cases of uh, summer of 2020, how the f initial votes on those two cases were five, uh, five, four, five, four, one, maybe like six, three-ish, and he worked like crazy to get both of them to seven to two decisions. And, you know, control, cajoling his, his colleagues, just trying to make them come together because he did not want, in these major cases involving the president at the time in such a polarized atmosphere, to be so sharply divided when earlier cases on separation of powers, like the Nixon uh, Watergate tapes case and the Clinton v. Jones case, that those at least had, had been unanimous. And he was trying to get as close to that as possible. But Justices Alito and Thomas were not going to play. But the others did. Well, we're likely going to see um, soon-ish a um, six to three ruling uh, in the Harvard and the University of North Carolina cases and the Supreme Court, in all likelihood, is going to rule, led by John Roberts, is going to rule against um, the constitu constitutionality of universities using affirmative action in college and higher education admissions, right? That's right. You know, when, when people ask about whether this is John Roberts' court, I say on race, race, racial remedies, it certainly is his. He has led the charge to cut back on the 1965 Voting Rights Act, to cut back on uh, racial affirmative action to cut back on all racial remedies, and I wouldn't be surprised if he's the one who ends up writing the Harvard and University of North Carolina cases, which would uh, go all the way back to the 1978 Bakke case and then the 2003 Grutter case, where the court said you could look at race, not for quotas, but to have a diverse student body for campus diversity, not to remedy any past wrongs, but for diversity, and that's what will probably be gone. And they're gonna, but they're gonna get rid of that. They're gonna say you can't, diversity is not a value that you can use when uh, deciding who to admit to your a university class. Right. right, So that's 
Don't say I didn't warn you. I'm telling you right now, this is going to happen. When do we find out about it? It's October? Uh, no, uh, June. June. Probably June, one we're going to hear. The last days of June, because they always, the harder ones always go right down to the wire. And just so everybody knows, they are so, they're having such a hard time deciding cases right now. They are way behind in their numbers, and they're just way behind in any of the big cases. And here we are in April. So it is going to be a really, um, Tough late May and June will be wild. And what uh, what are some of the other cases we are waiting to hear? In okay, addition, so we've to got a uh, Alabama voting rights case that's out there. We've got an interesting one that kind of is another takeoff on some of the consequences of the clash between uh, same-sex couples and religious rights, and that involves the web website designer uh, who didn't want to make a. Uh, she has a website designing business and did not want to. Uh, have to design uh, wedding websites for same-sex uh, couples. It's a follow-on, as some of you might remember, the uh, Colorado baker who didn't want to bake a cake for uh, uh, two gay men who were celebrating their marriage. So, so that's another one. And we have, you know, we have all sorts of cases that test kind of Biden administration initiatives too. So, you'll you'll you will see a series of cases that will start to continue re to reorder. You know, the. Uh, the state of play of culture wars, but also change how much authority the Biden administration has on things. And I would have to say that they might eventually actually hear the merits of the FDA uh, uh, abortion drug case, because right now what's in play is just, you know, will there be a pause on the litigation while the merits are heard? And I would think eventually they will decide, was the FDA right to give its approval and to set the, the limited uh, access restrictions that it did? So um, what's next? What's next after this book? I mean, I know this just came out. And <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I also know that you, you know, I, I, we were doing this a few years ago about the Ju Justice Roberts book. So yeah. what, what you must be, are you going to work on a sequel? I mean, th there's, no, uh, there's no end of the drama uh, going on there behind the scenes. Right. But I have to, I, I probably will do something else. But you have to think long and hard about it because, as you know, since you're always writing books, you just, you know, you, you lose friends, you don't go to movies, you, do, you, know, you just have to really want to do it, and you, so you have to pick your topic right. So I'm still casting about. Is there anything right. that's intriguing you right now? Oh, lots. Yeah. I mean, I have lots of ideas of things. Like, like so I, d I read somewhere, I think, didn't Justice uh, Ketanji Brown Jackson sign a deal to write her autobiography? Oh, my God, yeah, but, you know, it's like for millions. Right. Yeah. So you didn't get the same. <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> but right. does that happen? Do they do they do that? Has, have other justices done that? Yeah. Uh, Clarence Thomas did it. Sonia Sotomayor did it. Amy Coney Barrett, who doesn't have the same kind of story that these firsts or seconds have, uh, she also signed a contract uh, that we believe is over a million. They don't tell you exactly, and we have to look at we have to get word from the publishing side as we can, and then we see parts of the advance show up on financial disclosure forms, but she also got a contract. You know, if you're a justice and you write a book, you get a fabulous advance, and then you go on 60 Minutes. Mm -hmm. Except there are some, like Stephen Breyer, you know, people who do more brainier books, you know, who do just about the law, and it's not about themselves. They don't. So care. of the autobiographies, I assume you've read all of them, mm -hmm. what, wh are they good? Actually, they are, like, because they use, uh, they often will have ghostwriters. Right. You know, so they're, you know, Sonia Sotomayor was beautiful. It was great. Clarence Thomas's book, uh, my, Gar my Grandfather's Son, is the title of that. It's actually a really interesting book. And I noticed that it might be because of all the attention on him, but it's been sale selling a little better recently. And it might be because either people are picking it up to find out more about anything he says about uh, whether he likes yacht travel or RV travel. Um, <laughs> or, or maybe it's you know some of his defenders wanting to get at it. Yeah. So what is the biggest, I'm not going to say biggest scoop, but what's the biggest surprise? When you were writing this, what, what is, what is the, the revelation that you, were, you just couldn't believe? Well, some of it I turned, well, a lot of it I turned over to CNN as I was right, working Right, you were right, on, yes. Yeah, because I worked for them and I wanted to turn it over. But it's amazing how much people forgot we on CNN Digital and on TV, and people are like, wow, I didn't know this. So yeah, so there, it, some of the, vo the vote swaps on the gay rights cases, uh, the um, RBG getting kicked out of her chambers, and just how intertwined RBG staff after her funeral. After she after and, she passed, they yeah, kicked, they kicked was, her staff out that, quick. And yeah, and it's not it's not just that that, but I would say that moment of how much her death in, on September 18th 
2020 was so intertwined with the court's acceptance of the Dobbs case, because if that had come up just even three months earlier, it, the case would not have been heard. Because at that point in court history, it had not been taking up any uh, appeals from lower court decisions that appeared to conflict with Roe. But once she died and was succeeded by Amy Coney Barrett, right in the moment that Mississippi was appealing, it it just enabled that. So, um, we're, I mean, I'm, I'm talking to you in a bookstore where I'm sure there are RBG uh, puppets and uh, <laughs> shirts and dolls and, and, and mugs and socks back there. I know she's a very beloved figure, but I wonder now that there has been some distance from her death and we're also going through this very public discussion about Senator Dianne Feinstein and uh, her wherewithal to be doing the job she has, though obviously there's a Democratic governor uh, in California, so that's a l kind of a lower stake situation, although a lot of Democrats are, and a lot of other people are worried that, and distressed that they can't get their judicial nominations through the Senate right now because she's not there. Um, for, for, for the fans of RBG, for her former clerks, for her fellow justices, is there a rethinking of, boy, I wish she had taken the hint during the Obama years and, and retired? I'm sorry, I don't mean to be crass about it, but, but no. it had a big effect that she stuck yeah. around as long as she did. It and, did. And there has been, and one of the other things, speaking of things that I found out, uh, I found out that Obama had invited her to the White House for lunch back in 2013. I'd gotten a tip about it, so I went to see her and I said, is this true? And you could just see the gears in her head going and she, I could tell she was thinking, should I acknowledge that or not? I don't know. And then she said, well, I suppose you could see the White House logs of who went in. And I thought, huh, maybe, maybe not, but I'm glad you're about to tell me. So she told me all about this lunch that I later found out was exactly President Obama's effort, but then he couldn't quite say it out loud. What are you going to do? Now, she was 80 at the time, Jake. She was 80. He invites her over. But for also already had, had beat oh, cancer yeah. once or twice. In yeah. 19, I think her first cancer was in 1999. Then she had one in 2009. She was before the lung cancer and, of course, all the other things that had happened. But she had already had two, two very serious cancers and, um, and had survived them. And he tried to see. He had a Democratic Senate at the time. And he tried to see, will she go? And I asked her, I said, do you think he was fishing? And she said, I don't think he was fishing. And I said, why do you think he invited you over? And she said, well, I think because he likes me. I like him. <laughs> so, you know, and, but so many people who do still love her memory do second guess her decision to stay just because of what has happened. And she got so close, you know, September of 2020, if she had just made it to January um, 18th, of instead of September 18th, and she'd be right on the cusp of January 20th, and that would have been it. I don't want to hog all the time. I know uh, this is a very smart crowd, a very smart audience, so um, there's a microphone right there. I will ask you to come so everybody can hear uh, if you have questions. I prefer to have it be boy, girl, boy, girl, uh, <laughs> if possible, uh, just to spread the love, but we'll start with a boy. Go ahead, sir. On the horizon, do you see any mechanism that can stop this cage match between the, the two sides. It's, it seems like just like the House of Representatives where they're operating in a different universe and the dissenting opinions from one side are so insulting to the majority and vice versa and they obviously let the opinions go out that way without any modification to uh, address the concerns in the competing opinions, is it just going to keep spiraling into uh, a, an impasse? Well, I think that tempers can be tamped down at certain times, not in June, so I think it's only going to get worse in that regard. But I read a really interesting study uh, that some professors up at Yale did about the future of the court based on the ages. Now remember, the Trump appointees are really young. Uh, based on the ages of the justices, strategic retirements, which because of RBG and uh, Justice Scalia, people are now thinking, you know, I have to strategically retire, that essentially the court that we have now in its general form will be the court for the next 50 years. In terms of, I know, I hate to say that, everybody's like, <laughs> a friend of mine wrote when I quoted that in a story, like, when do I jump off the cliff? But it's, you know, but no, I think, I think we're, this court, this version of the court is with us. 
The Economist had a story uh, within the last few days about Thomas, mm -hmm. and it said it's not a Thomas problem. What are the other ones doing? What have they done? I wonder if you'd comment on that. I, I will. I don't know. You don't know what you don't know when it comes to the court. And I think probably Clarence Thomas's trips as let you know are really attention getting because they're to all these great places across the globe on this super yacht and private jet. But I don't doubt that you know there's a culture there was there's a culture of non disclosure there. So I would be willing to believe that other justices might have similar situations. I just you just don't know. And the thing is you it's hard to find out unless you get a tip from someone who knew that Justice Scalia was always at a certain hunting lodge, you know, because they don't have to disclose. Is it just to do a, a just to do a quick follow up? Yeah. Is it not true that the House and the Senate and the President could pass legislation requiring some sort of disclosure and code of ethics? Could they not do that? They could do that. Now, here's the issue with that, and they they obviously have these kinds of codes of ethics for themselves. You know, we we all know what kind of junkets they're always going on. And there, you know, the, the basic law about disclosure is a post Watergate law that applies to everyone. There, there, there has been a skittishness on the part of some members of Congress because of the separation of powers issues. And I think what they've thought at times about is maybe tying part of the, the appropriation to the judicial branch to some sort of reporting. Or what they want is for the court itself to try to self police to have its own ethics code. And the chief used to say, we will, we will, just wait. And as you say, that was 69, right? Yeah, that was Chief Justice Earl Warren. Yeah, Earl Warren. Um, yeah so they could, but they won't. Um, go ahead, sir. Um, I was just wondering, what are our chances of getting uh, like court expansion or court reform? Seems like uh, the court especially needs it now, and compared to the history of it, like where? You know, a lot of people, uh, progressives have wanted either term limits or mm. court expansion. But I have to say, when President Joe Biden is against it, and many members of Congress are still such institutionalists that mm. they're against it, I just don't see that in the cards. Because you, you could add to the number of seats just by congressional legislation, because uh, Congress can do it. It's been as low as five, as high as 10. We've been at uh, nine for about 150 years. Uh, so that <coughs> Congress could do. But you don't see that. I mean, you see proposals, but you don't see them moving. And then on term limits, arguably, that might have to take a constitutional amendment because there is a provision that says these justices under Article Three are appointed for life. But and I, I actually think the term limits idea is something that could be workable. But you just don't see the people who would be in charge of pushing that through mm -hmm. moving on it. I mean, they won't do term limits from themselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> right. I mean, it's it's tough to make the argument. Well, the Supreme Court should have term limits, and I've been here for seventy-five years. But, uh, you know. <laughs> Um, I was surprised that uh, Justice Thomas commented at all on his issues. Um, he's done it twice now, which uh, what, what do you, I have, so I have two questions. One is, what do you think that's about? Why doesn't he just keep his mouth closed like he's been doing all this time? And the other question is, he did say he got help from AIDS. Most federal employees, I know probably many people in this room, mm -hmm. had to fill those forms out, and they have ethics officers in the agencies. Is there somebody in the court that helps the justices figure out what those rules mean? Actually, They're so hard. Actually, all of the judges have, um, justices and judges, get a, get certain help in these forms. And uh, about him, I was so happy he responded. I'll take any response from any of them. You know, the chief <laughs> hasn't, hasn't said anything. So I was glad that he at least said, look, it was true that he had reported some trips, as you know. He had reported some of these trips, and then once, once the LA Times had written a story about these trips, he just stopped reporting them. And I'm just wondering how much it might have been that um, that his colleagues said, "Hey, why open yourself up to negative criticism? Uh, criticism this way." So um, he, but he, I don't. I, I'm not sure what you're thinking of the second time. He did just say out loud once he acknowledged. Oh, I thought publicly. it was twice. I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's okay. He said, you know what you might be thinking of? Um, our colleague, Ariane DeVogue, found out through someone close to Clarence Thomas that he was going to amend his form uh. on the second time around for the second one. But he has not 
made any public statements about that or, frankly, about the one that's always been percolating out there about Ginny Thomas's activities related to the 2020 election and his sitting on cases related to it. Yeah. Can, I, can I just touch on, on with, as with a follow-up to that question, yeah. which has the, cause has the Supreme Court always been this opaque? Have they always just like historically refused to answer questions? Because obviously there was an era where people would, you know, be on the Supreme Court and then they'd run for president or they'd be president and then they'd be on the Supreme Court like, where there was much more blending of being a public figure and being on the Supreme Court. Has it always just been this secretive? No. In fact, even in my time covering the court, I could get real comment from justices for, you know, like not, not off the record. I could get something that would say, well, this is the explanation for it. Even like th our past questioner, like the woman just said, Clarence Thomas said something then. I could routinely get an explanation. I could routinely get something, you know, from Justice Scalia, you know, even the quack quack after the duck hunting thing. You know, like you could get, you could get them to at least address it even though they might be defensive about it, but they would address it and now they don't. So things have changed for sure. Uh, you touched on one issue that has always intrigued me about uh, uh, Justice Ginsburg. Mm -hmm. She traveled around the world with Scalia. Mm -hmm. She must have known that Scalia was part of this movement to essentially upturn democracy. She must, I mean, Jane Mayer has written about it, Nancy McLean, and, and a lot of other commentators who maybe not the wide public followed that much, but certainly is a very bright person. She must have known known about that. That seemed to sort of take the edge off this, uh, of the hardness of this right-wing plan, you know, which came to fruition, unfortunately, in the last several years. Uh, it's hard to believe she didn't see that coming, I mean, as bright as she was. I don't think she did see how deep-rooted some of this was. I mean, she, she loved Scalia. She just, uh, and one of her great lines to me was, I love Nino, but I'd love to strangle him. You know, so she, she had, um, I think she saw him for what he was, but I think she also gave him the benefit of the doubt as a human being. Well, they, you know, they even had, what was it, New Year's dinners together yeah. Uh, yeah. with his uh, hunting yeah. uh, trophies and so on, That's, uh, which of course raises other questions. I don't know if you know uh, to what extent uh, Scalia also violated some of the uh, friendship and, uh, and you know, benefits issues? It, it's very hard to know, but when he did pass away, all of a sudden people became much more aware of various trips he had taken that were not to go speak at universities, rather to, to go hunting. And, I mean, the question really is um, beyond the uh, disclosure, it's uh, have any of these individuals been accepting gifts from people that have business before the court, not just they agree with them on issues X, Y, Z, but in a way, you know, are, are, the, are they giving gifts of, uh, towards people so that they get a benefit uh, in a ruling? Um, and I have not seen any evidence of that, but I'm certainly willing to hear of any if there is any, if we can move on to the next one. Hey there. Hi, Joan and Jake. Um, Joan, this may fall into the category of you don't know what you can't know, but um, as much as I'd like to know, well, you could, it's a two-prong, I guess, of internal machination since you know the Chief Justice so well. You mentioned that the ethics code, he would like to have one, but he can't get unanimity. Who's, who are the holdouts? But I'm more interested, since we haven't talked as much about the um, January 6, 2021, what do his colleagues and especially Chief Justice Roberts, think about the fact that, um, by my count, Justice Thomas has now voted three times on cases that are about January 6th, one of which directly implicates Ginny Thomas. So, I mean, it just, the idea that he won't recuse, what do they think of that? Actually, on that issue, I found that some of them really were cutting him some slack. I have to say, people, within the court like Justice Thomas, personally. And he, you know, I have to say that uh, someone from the left said to me in uh, regard to the Ginny issue that was percolating up, you know, after we found the uh, Mark Meadows text between her and Mark Meadows about um, uh, 
when she said you have to you have to do more to overturn the election, you have to get the right guy in here and all this, uh, that some of them just saw that as a way to attack the court. Uh, a line that I've said so much, you know, they 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 will be divided internally, but when they get criticism from any of us on the outside, they close ranks. And I haven't gotten a full feel for what's going on now in light of all these travel issues and the gift issues relative to Clarence Thomas, but I know on the Ginny, uh, they, were, they were giving him a pass. Do you think Justice Roberts just never takes Clarence Thomas aside and say, I mean, if he's such an institutionist, uh, two institutionalists, Roberts, that is, and the court's poll ratings are what they are. How can he not see how this is contributing to a sense of the delegitimate, de de go ahead, Jake, what's the word? Delegitimization. <laughs> of the court. Thank you. This is why I went into print and you went into print. I don't know if he buys the thesis, Jackie. I think, I think what he th believes is, you know, it, Jake had asked me as part of the question, is it just that they don't like our rulings? Is it just that they don't like how far uh, to the right that Clarence Thomas votes? I think he has a lot of ambivalences. I think he wants to be able to project something that, ha that could uh, maintain the court's stature in America or, or regain it, uh, but I don't think he completely subscribes to the idea that it's a problem of their making. You know, I was just reminded of the fact that Michael Ludig, who was a, a big uh, appeals court judge here in yeah. Washington, D.C., was mentioned on George W. Bush, uh, his list for Supreme Court justice, yeah. or maybe George H.W. But yeah, there was a w. case, to, and, and, and I, I'm sorry to put you on the spot, um, but you, you must know. I believe Ludig's father was murdered? Yeah, it's a terrible story. Uh, actually, there, there, Michael Ludig has a really interesting story. Uh, he, he was... He, he actually clerked for Berger, he clerked for Scalia, he's been around a long time, and uh, George H.W. Bush put him on the Fourth Circuit. There was a terrible incident of, uh, involving his father and mother. They were victims of carjacking. I believe it was down in Texas, and his father died, and his mother witnessed this terrible, terrible event. Eventually, the, the man who killed the father was uh, executed. And, and Michael Ludig kept serving then on the Fourth Circuit, and he was, at one point, one of the most conservative uh, judges on the Fourth, which is based out of Richmond. And he was on George W. Bush's shortlist. He was very much in contention against John Roberts, so I did a lot of research uh, on uh, Ludig's chances back then, and he did not get it. And he was very angry about that and left the bench, and then went on to be a general counsel at Boeing. But you know, some years later, this was all back in 2005, 2006, when John Roberts and Sam Alito got the two appointments. He has really changed sort of his, his voice in the uh, public sphere as someone who is very critical of the Supreme Court, very critical of, of Donald Trump, very critical of election deniers and people who would challenge democracy, and uh, just such, cutting such a different figure now. One, one of the reasons I bring it up is because I believe that uh, I believe that the case, the capital case about the from the guy, the carjacker, went to the Supreme Court, and I think a couple justices recused themselves. Well, you have a good memory. That's exactly what happened. Because they were because they're friends with Ludig, right? Yeah. Well, what happened was it, not just were they friends with Ludig, but Ludig had worked with them when he was in the uh, it connected to the administration and judge picking for George H.W. Bush. He had actually, this is kind of an interesting story involving Clarence Thomas, he was once very close to Clarence Thomas. He had gotten the appointment to the Fourth Circuit back in 1991, but waited to actually take his seat, if I'm remembering right, he waited to take his seat so that he could help Clarence Thomas with his nomination hearings. So it wasn't just friendship, he had actually had a kind of a partnership with some of these justices. And he had been really close to Clarence Thomas, but I don't think he's talked to him for uh, several years now. So my, my point was that they are willing to recuse themselves, or they used to be. They used to be oh, yeah, willing, because I, 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 I think Thomas recused himself yeah, from the case. Yeah, and I think David Souter did too, because David Souter, yeah. who came on in 1990, had also been part of the judge-picking machine of HW. One last question, sir, go ahead. Sure, thanks. Uh, I'd begin by saying that the previous questioner, Jackie Combs, another outstanding journalist, who's written an outstanding book called Dissent about some of the run-up to this. 
uh, absolutely true. Jackie Columns, right. the book is Descent. Now at the LA Times. She's here right. if you want to grab a Sharpie. <laughs> after, you, after you buy Joan's book, Jackie's right there. Definitely. I wanted to ask uh, if you could discuss something, some of the most wonderful reporting you've done over the years that I've admired, and in this book, is, uh, as Jake said, some of the behind the scenes mm -hmm deal making and what goes on. Now the justices would say they don't, don't speak to this. Their clerks are pledged to confidentiality. I wonder if you could, uh, for the general audience, pierce some of the mystery as to how one goes about the challenges of reporting at the Supreme Court. When you report about arrangements or discussions or some of the things you've even mentioned tonight, um, do particular justices dispatch intermediaries to discuss things with you uh, without acknowledging it? Uh, do clerks actually? Yeah, really. Oh, no, without naming anybody. No, no. no I, I, uh, and or or do, uh, do do any clerks talk? Do they talk after they're gone more? Uh, he was asking about sources. I have to say, I work very hard over many years to cultivate relationships mainly with justices because you have to avoid kind of these chamber-centric views of the world. And if you're, first of all, I, I'd be the first to say, current clerks don't want to talk. They're, they're just so scared. So I don't even make runs at cur current clerks. Sometimes I get lucky because of previously existing relationships, but it, I take nothing for granted in terms of who will talk to me and it just takes lots of working over years, over years, over years. And it pays off. The book is Nine Black Robes, <laughs> Inside the Supreme Court's Drive to the Right and Its Historic Consequences. The author, still the best Supreme Court reporter in the United States of America, Joan Biscupa. So co copies of Joan's book are available at the checkout desk. We also have some copies of uh, Jake's great novels. Uh, Joan will be up here signing. I don't know if Jake may uh, stick around. Please form a line to the right of the table and help our staff by folding up your chairs.